Looking to recharge your prayer life this year? Jesus Listens is a new 365-day prayer devotional from Sarah Young. Available now at jesuscalling.com slash jesuslistens. I think it takes us longer to forgive ourselves than it does for other people to forgive us. And all I can do is ask for forgiveness and and try to be the best woman that I can be. And, And just know that He loves us all and He just wants us to be close to Him. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Michael Angelo famously said, the sculpture is already complete within the marble block before I start my work. It's already there. I just have to chisel away at the superfluous material. This quote creatively and non-judgmentally describes the process of removing unwanted traits, polishing gifts, and working raw materials to create something memorable. Like the artist, God is always shaping us until we eventually realize what emerges from that process reveals the beauty of who we are as God's creation. This week, we talk to two people who understand this sometimes difficult and loving sculpting process. Taylor Lynn is the granddaughter of country music legend Loretta Lynn, and she understands the perils of chipping past substance addiction to find her true, beautiful self. Hannah Dasher tells of working through the pain of her parents' divorce to find her dream of becoming a country musician materialize on social media. Both stories highlight the fact that we are all in the process of becoming complete. My name is Taylor Lynn, and my grandmother is the coal miner's daughter, Loretta Lynn, and I am blessed enough to get to go around and tell some of her stories and sing her songs with actually Conway Twitty's grandson, Trey Twitty. You know, I I feel like I lived like five different lives as a child. I was spoiled by my mom and her mom in that family in Franklin. And then I also loved Mima and my dad and the road, but I couldn't get enough of them. So I would just watch Coal Miner's Daughter every day. And, And then my mom got remarried when I was about seven to my stepdad, which he was an alcoholic. So I either really loved him and he was great or he was in his disease and he was abusive. And then I would resent my dad because he wasn't there to save me. But then I would, you know, crawl into my stepdad's lap because I was mad at my dad. You know, it just, but then nobody even knew anything was wrong because I was also really happy. And we lived in a small town and I've always had wonderful friends and my grandmothers and aunts and and those parts of my family made up for any pain that I had. When I was little, my relationship with God started off in a really sweet way. Uh, You know, I had an, an aunt, she was Church of Christ, and we would go to Sunday school and church with her all the time. And of course, I, being a wild child, never liked to sit down in church or, or concentrate on anything. So she would like read us little Bible stories and and tell us that God was love. You know, Jesus is love. That's all you need to know. Jesus is love. He's always here for you. And so as a child, I love Jesus. I mean, I just thought that was the most incredible thing in the world that we had this thing that loved us unconditionally. I lived with my mom out in Franklin, Tennessee with her side of the family. And then my dad was on the road with my grandmother Loretta just all the time. And so it went between really like wanting to be with my dad and being resentful at him because I never got to see him. But then also being super grateful because to see him, I got to go out on the road with my grandmother, which was a dream. Mima has always been very present in my life. We've had this connection since I was little. And so when I was very little, because I heard it all the time, I mean like three or four years old, I sang all of Coal Miner's Daughter standing in a corner with my nose pressed into the corner to Mima. And Mima was like, well, Cindy, I, I think that she actually can sing. And so from that point, Mima started going, you know, you're a singer. You, you're, you've got this, like lots of little girls who grow up watching a rags to riches story. And, and I'm at this point living in a junkyard, in a trailer, in the sixth grade, watching this film going, I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. And then I can be like her. She got out of there. She's that. I can be that.
The first time I drank, I was an alcoholic. I was 14. And as I got, you know, into my teenage years and there was abuse and terror at our house at times, it was literally me and God in a closet, you know, like it was just me and God. I mean, that was, that is, that was it. I knew nobody else would protect me. And I knew that he would somehow, and I would be okay with him hand in hand. So when I got away from mom and moved in with me, mom, and realized, you know, like at least the honky tonks in downtown Nashville were going to let me do whatever I wanted to because of me, mom, maybe not anywhere else in the world, but definitely downtown Nashville. And I just got in the drug scene really, really fast down there. And it was, it was days. I mean, I remember, you know, trying cooking for the first time, trying pain pills were my main addiction. And just thinking every hole that I've had in my heart was filled immediately. And not only that, I mean, Meemaw didn't really know what I was up to, but like I was also on the road with her as a job. When I started using drugs, I would hide from him. Like I can literally picture myself still like putting up a curtain from my heart, from my head, where God couldn't see what I was doing. And if he could, I would just say, God, please, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't. Or God, please help me get out of this. Help me, help me, help me, help me. So fast forward, you know, 12 years or whatever later, and I'm sitting on a bus and sitting on her stage, signing autographs to her fans and thinking, okay, this is, you know, I finally, like I survived that and now I'm here and and things are good. But it, it wasn't long until I couldn't hold that anymore. I couldn't go on the road. I couldn't sign an autograph. I couldn't go on stage. I mean, I was just too lost. The drugs became the most important thing. And she actually sent me to my first rehab out in Sierra Tucson when I was like close to 20. You know, that was first of eight. It took it took a lot of years for me to get to good. When I got off of heroin and crack in 2004, I was so sick. I weighed 82 pounds. I'm five foot one. I was bruised all over. I was so sick. I I mean, they picked me up from jail. I mean, just the whole shebang. I was so grateful to be in a rehab and have food. And like, by that time, I was going to die. I was trapped with some drug dealer. I mean, you know, just disgusting life. And so I had been hiding and running. And I think at that point in 2004, I was just so grateful to be alive and I could start feeling that spiritual connection again. So shame came when I was sober for eight years with all the knowledge in the world, with sobriety under my belt. And I'm married and living in Seattle and have a beautiful life and a new baby. And when he was two or three months old, I got on Adderall. They said, you know, you have ADHD, which is true. This is what you need. And I said, well, it's a narcotic. I I can't take that. And she said, no, it's actually a Schedule C, but it's not a narcotic. And And at that point, that was all I needed to hear. And I started taking them. And it was, like I said before, it was days where I was just taking them like candy all day, every day. And I relapsed for about six, seven months. And when my husband realized what was going on, I mean, he had no idea what marrying an alcoholic and addict. He didn't know me before, so he didn't know what it looked like. I relapsed eight years later on Adderall after I had my son. I think as a mama, it's a little bit harder to let go and forgive yourself when you feel like you've maybe done something to your kid. You just feel that kind of guilt anytime you're not being the best mom you can. I still have shame that I'm working on from that because then you've got a baby, you know, and then you've got a husband. It's not like you're just out there on your own at 27. I mean, I was 36. So it was like I was a grown woman making these decisions. 
when I got sober, you know, you find all these devotion books, you know, you're just always searching for some way to get closer to God. And I found Jesus calling like at Barnes and Noble. I think I was just at a bookstore and the book is so cute anyway, you know, it's like a little book and I opened the book and read one devotion. I was like, Oh my goodness. It just rang so true. And I bought it and I bought one for every, I was living at a halfway house and I bought one for every girl there. And we would wake up every morning and do the Jesus calling devotional and just pray and and speak on that. And through the years I've bought them as gifts. I have to get up every single morning and pray and get connected to God and read some sort of spiritual material and turn my will and my life over to God or I'm right back there. It is a disease and it lasts a lifetime. And I think when we live with the disease, I mean, the disease of alcoholism and addiction is for me a forever disease that I will have to take care of and nurture for the rest of my life. So I think that there is that healthy fear for me that I could step out of line at any time if I'm not spiritually fit and if I'm not connected to God. So I have to remain connected in order to remain spiritually fit, in order to do the right things. So I think there's just always that little piece of, God, trust me, what? You know, like almost like he's so good and I know that, but I I can forget it in a second. And then But then you get the spiritual awakening again and again, like, oh my gosh, I am loved and I am trusted and I am good. I am grateful for the relapse. You know, I I am grateful for all the times that I went to rehab and I learned something. I think that in my last stint of sobriety, that was over eight years, I just thought, there's no way I'll relapse. I mean, I've I've hit bottom. I'm never going to go back. And then understanding it's been over eight years now that I've been totally sober again, you know, yes. I can relapse. And so I think it's really like understanding that I have to stay connected and I have to be of service and I have to call another alcoholic or addict and I've got to stay right in the middle of the boat or I'm right back in the middle of it. And it's, it's there every day. So just really and truly believing that and believing that a power greater than me is the answer to it all. It's this hole that only God can feel. And as long as I know that and I have total faith in that. Even if I question if I'm doing the right thing, just knowing God's got it if I'll just let Him. And I turn my back on God all the time. He never turns it on me. I have been so lucky that my family, you know, both of my grandmothers, my dad, my mama, my siblings, my best friends that I grew up with never left. Nobody ever left me. Not one time. Nobody ever said, go away. And, you know, today I live on the ranch, on my grandmother's ranch out in Hurricane Mills. And I get to live next door to my grandmother and and see her all the time. And my dad and my stepmom and my cousins and My husband stayed, you know, he could have left when he realized what a maniac he was married to, you know, eight and a half years ago. I mean, he could have left. And instead, I never felt abandoned. I never felt like God wasn't there. I always knew any time that I wasn't feeling God, it was because that was of my own doing. God is everything to me. Jesus is everything to me. You know, it's always been that way. I'm going to read a passage from Jesus Calling, and this is dated December 10th. Make me the focal point of your search for security. In your private thoughts, you are still trying to order your world so that it is predictable and feels safe. Not only is this an impossible goal, but it is also counterproductive to spiritual growth. When your private world feels unsteady and you grip my hand for support, you are living in conscious dependence on me. Instead of yearning for a problem-free life, rejoice that trouble can highlight your awareness of my presence. 
In the darkness of adversity, you are able to see more clearly the radiance of my face. Accept the value of problems in this life, considering them pure joy. Remember that you have an eternity of trouble-free living awaiting you in heaven. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. To learn more about Taylor Lynn's 2021 release, Taylor Lynn Sings Loretta Lynn, go to taylorlynn.com. Stay tuned to Hannah Dasher's story after a brief message. With so much demanded of us, it can be hard to find the time to grow our faith each day. But now you can take God's presence with you wherever you go with the newly updated Jesus Calling mobile app. You'll be able to read a devotion for each day, look up scriptures, purchase Sarah Young products, and keep notes. You can even check out the latest podcast episodes and read the newest blog posts from our incredible guests. This sleek and easy-to-navigate app is available for purchase on both Apple and Android. Download it today. Our next guest is Hannah Dasher, a country music artist and viral TikTok content creator. Known for her big hair and exuberant personality, Hannah moved to Nashville in hopes of achieving her dreams of being a country music star. Hear how Hannah's faith helped her build a legacy and inspired her to combine her passions for food, music, and entertainment. I'm Hannah Dasher, Sony RCA Nashville recording artist, TikTok personality, host of Stand By Your Pan, and uh, I have fun for a living when I'm not making country music or rock and roll or fixing something fattening for somebody else. I could sing before I could talk. It's, it's like God planted a, a hunger to make music inside of me at an early age. And so you can imagine what an impression my first concert made on me. And it was Alan Jackson. And I couldn't read yet, but as I got older, because I was just three years old, but as I got older and started to read, I didn't like to read books. I would read liner notes and albums. And his lyrics just stood out to me so much. They were so strong. I believed every word. So much so, I believed that Chasing that neon rainbow could be my dream come reality one day. And here we are. I didn't know I had it in me until my parents went through a divorce after you know, their 20 year wedding anniversary. And it just introduced this whirlwind of emotions that I'd never experienced before. And I had to release that in some way. So I put pen to paper and I picked up a guitar and I started writing songs and they were terrible. But my friends kept asking to hear them again. And that encouraged me to keep digging, and uh, my music and my faith really got me through that, and they still do. Moving to Nashville will make a believer out of you. I've been up here for 11 years, and living off of a songwriting publisher's salary, you really have to rely on your faith when you don't have anything else, and he has always met my needs. I mean, there's so many stories of not having enough to eat, and someone showed up to bring me lunch one day, or not enough rent money, and I've always had a place, but it's always come from somewhere. I was introduced uh, to Jesus Calling in 2014. A boyfriend, well, ex-boyfriend of mine, his mother bought the devotion book for me, and I, it's the one that I still use today. And every time I open it, I'm reminded that you know, his plans are way better than my own. Thank God. But uh, it's so important to spend quality time with the Lord each day. It holds me accountable. Lord knows I need it. And uh, it really makes me sensitive to opportunities that He's put in my path. And Mom has always said, if you meet with the Lord early in the morning, it makes more time in your day. And I really do believe that. The coolest moment that's happened was before I ever got a publishing deal. It was 10 years ago. I was out of work, didn't have a job. I was working some odd jobs to make ends meet. And I was working with Bobby Pinson, who's a hit writer in Nashville, and his wife, who was a Saint, Lucy. and. She told me about making a wish list for God. She said, when Bobby and I met, he was broke as a joke, had nothing, and she had him make a wish list. And by the end of that period, he had checked everything off of his list. He, uh, he wanted to buy an engagement ring for her, for example, and didn't have the money to do it. But he received a check in the mail for an overpayment of a bill for the exact amount 
of the value of that ring that he had picked out for her. And that just floored me. So when I got home that afternoon, before I got out of my car, I pulled up my iPhone and I made my prayer list, a wish list for God in my notes. And I put major publishing deal at the top of that. And as soon as I hit done, my attorney called me with my phone still in my hand. And he said, hey, congratulations. I got the paperwork. You've got first major publishing deal. And so I, I still use that list today. I've been so thankful to check things off of it. But uh, it's been really fun to share in my friends' victories, too, because they're on there, too, and I like to send them little screenshots, <laughs> you know, and I'm deleting one off of the list. But there's been a lot of God moments, and I'm just very, very thankful. I'm not here in this career for me. I'm here by His design, and I'm a vessel for Him to further His kingdom, not my own. And when I finally started to realize that, it removed so much pressure from me and really Turn it into purpose. To learn more about Hannah Dasher, visit hannahdasher.com. If you'd like to hear more stories about faith and music, check out our interview with Chris Jansen. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we sit down with CEO of McCann World Group of China, Emily Chang who shares that living into her social legacy has not only deeply enriched her home life, it's also enabled her to become a more authentic and relatable leader in the workplace. Faith is taking a step without knowing exactly the outcome, but having absolute conviction that God is at work and you get to be a part of what He is doing. And I think every time you say yes, not only does yes amplify into more yes, but it strengthens your faith and your conviction. So the next time you say yes, you do it a little less fearfully. And the time after that, you do it with anticipation. Want to hear more inspirational stories of people who have been changed by a closer walk with God? Then subscribe today to the Jesus Calling Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please be sure to leave a review, which helps us reach and inspire others with these stories. Plus, if you like seeing our guests as well as hearing them, you can find video interviews available on our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Jesus Calling Book, on Facebook, and on the Jesus Calling Instagram page.